Hey everyone, Pastor Bill Wiggs here from the Sunfield and Greenwood United Methodist Churches in Southern Illinois. This video was taken on Wednesday night at the Sunfield Church, and it is our Bible study and prayer meeting. We are in the middle of a series of sermons on the seven deadly sins. On Wednesday nights, what we're doing is we're taking a look at the sin, and then we're looking at the antidote to that sin. And so as we have this discussion tonight, I'm going to be doing some teaching, and then uh, we're going to have kind of some group discussion. Then we're going to have some prayer time together. I hope that this will be a blessing to you. You'll learn a lot, and it will help you to grow in your faith as a believer in Jesus Christ. So at this time, let us go into the fellowship hall as we begin our time together. All right, well, tonight we're going to continue our study of the seven deadly sins and the seven cardinal virtues. And all during Lent, we are exploring the deadliest sins that seem to consume us as human beings. But God doesn't really want us to be slaves to sin. God wants us to live in freedom. Now, so far we've spent some time looking at the sins of lust and the sins of greed, and this week we're looking at the sin of gluttony, and uh, over the next few weeks we're going to be looking at the sins of sloth and wrath and envy and pride. And with each of these sins, we're looking at their antidote and trying to kind of focus in on that and looking at what it means to to really live a life that pleases God. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to be looking at a, a lot of different passages tonight and really spend some time kind of going through uh, a number of scenarios, biblical stories that help us to understand uh, this situation a lot more. But before we do that, let's pray together. Gracious, Gracious God, God, we do not live by bread, bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. All right, well, enticing us wherever we go and whenever they can, uh, restaurant uh, dessert menus are replete with sumptuous photos of the uh, the entrees and everything there just tempting us and i saw this on a uh, a menu one time a long time ago if there are seven deadly sins then here are eight nine and ten <laughs> and it was on their dessert menu another one uh, said give in to the urge splurge <laughs> And so, of course, some names of the desserts. Uh, Death by chocolate. My favorite. Your favorite, yeah. Uh, My favorite way to die, chocolate. <laughs> Praline <laughs> paradise. And, of course, there's no dream that starts with coconut for me, but coconut dream yeah. uh, is the name of a, a dessert that's on a menu. And so it's really easy to see why in our society and in affluent societies, it's really easy when everything's at our fingertips for us to, to be a bit gluttonous. That's really, a, that's really probably the easiest one. And it is the less looked down upon sin uh, within our culture. Uh, however... Until your doctor tells you you need to lose weight. Right, yeah. And what's interesting is gluttony seems to be the favorite sin of Americans and it's all fine until you get fat and then they don't want to, then they, they talk down about you once you're fat. Well, if you just had a little more self-control. Mm -hmm. They talk down about you when you're skinny too. That's yeah. true. Either yeah. end of the spectrum. <laughs> There's perfect. Now, I don't know what perfect is, but people know what it is and they're going to kind of persecute everybody else and often perfect is what you what you are perfect whatever is, you are is our heavenly body that we'll get right when we are with our maker exactly exactly well to make matters worse uh their temptations are just really very consistently convenient in our world today you know um and really on a daily basis and even hourly commercials and advertising is all over the place 
Well, according to Dr. Kelly Brunell, director of the Center for Eating and Weight Disorders at Yale University, children see an average of 10,000 food advertisements a year. Now think about that. Children see 10,000. Isn't that amazing? An average of 10,000 food advertisements a year, and most of those are for sweet cereals, fast food, candy, and soft drinks of some sort, and, and we could add to this list, I'm sure, energy drinks. Oh, yeah. You know, because that is a big one now. Um, so if we have trouble resisting, how do you think that affects children as well? If they're putting those, you know, 10,000 on average ads out there to kids who have less impulse control than adults, can you imagine what that is? So in what ways then has gluttony affected our society? In what ways has it affected our society? It's rampant, we know, but how has it affected our society? Our health. Our health. Our health is a big one, isn't it? Yeah. Anything I think else? people have gotten so used to being gluttonous that they don't pay attention anymore. It's just a, a way of life. It's a habit. You eat because it's there and it looks good. Okay. And it tastes good. Yeah. You know. Everything you do has got food involved in it. Yep. Any, yes. You know, when you go visit somebody, you eat, and you, you know, just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because of that, it can be even easier to be gluttonous about it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? How has it affected our society? It's led to some new businesses, some to help you with your gluttony, <laughs> with the, um, the have your groceries delivered to you. You don't have to be seen in the store buying the stuff. It's delivered in a box to your door. Um, but then also new businesses to help you lose the weight that you gained because of all the gluttony. That's true. So it's led to, to some commercial business opportunities for some people. Okay. I'd be really curious uh, if you could take, and I know there's, I don't know how you do this study, but if you could take the grocery orders of those who have to personally go through an aisle where there is a cashier, versus those who go through the self-check where you are being watched, but a cashier's not picking up every item, are those who get everything loaded by somebody else, you know, they have the personal shopper kind of situation like Walmart, and you send in your order that someone will go around and get everything and take it out to your car. You don't even have to go to the store. I'd be curious if the grocery choices are different for those three categories. That'd be an interesting thing to know. Is if, you know, is what you buy where you have to go through the cashier, who you may know, healthier than those who are getting the groceries put on into the cart and brought out to their car without them ever going in? I'd be curious if there's a difference there. I would say they would be because you pick up stuff if you go through the store looking where they're just going to bring you just exactly what you ordered. Well, that's true. Else. I think, sure. I think Sharon's right on that, but for me, I guess it's just because I'm old. I don't know that I'd, it'd make any difference to me. Yeah. <laughs> if I wanted it, I'd get it. I mean, yeah. True. I mean, but if it's a brand new item you didn't know existed, you're well, not I mean, in the store. Like Sharon it. said, you, yeah. you, yeah. you don't know, have them box it up. You're just going to have them box up what you want. I mean, what you see you need, you're not going to look at. Yeah, those, those quick grab items, probably not as big. Yeah. yeah, there was a time where they were putting the no candy aisle in grocery stores, where there'd be no candy there at the checkout. And that's pretty much gone now because they found they were losing so much sales. Yeah. Because if you wanted the candy, you had to go to get it instead of you're standing in line waiting for them to, to check you out. And you go, oh, look, there's a Snickers bar. You know, it's a big difference that way because it's a lot of it is impulse, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a working definition of gluttony. The word gluttony is derived from the Latin glutera, meaning to gulp down or swallow, overindulgence or overconsumption of food, drink, or luxurious items to the point of extravagance or waste. 
That's an interesting definition. Let's do it one more time. The word gluttony is derived from the Latin glutera, meaning to gulp down or swallow, overindulgence, and overconsumption of food, drink, and luxurious items to the point of extravagance and waste. What do you think of that definition? That's an interesting one. Sometimes we just think of gluttony as eating too much, you know, too big of portions. But this seems to take it a little bit different direct direction. What do you think? Especially that last phrase what there. What are the luxurious items? Can that, I mean, that can cover anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly can. And that, to the point of extravagance or waste, waste is the interesting one. Well, I mean, you can you can look at at some people's closets. Mm -hmm. If you want to go with that, or you know, people that have shoe fetishes where they've got three hundred pair of shoes, or yeah. the clothing that they'll absolutely never be able to wear if they wore didn't wear the same thing ever again. Right. I mean, that that is what I mean. It is. And a waste. And a waste. And a waste. Yeah. Uh, we're everyone here, I think, it, it, perhaps maybe not Melissa, but I think everybody else is old enough to remember the pictures of Imelda Marcos' Marcos closet. Yeah. Does anyone remember how many pairs of shoes she had? I don't remember oh, anymore. It was no. thousands. It was unbelievable, though, the number of shoes she had. Yeah, it was in the thousands. That, I would say, was a gluttonous attitude towards shoes. I still can't figure out why. They're just shoes. You know, what is it about shoes that uh, some people really have a, a buying problem with them? Well, the teaching on gluttony from the church is really quite interesting. And this, is, this goes back you know, all the way into the Middle Ages even. Uh, church leaders in the, in the deeply ascetic mid Middle Ages. What does that mean? It means um, basically you deprive yourself of everything. Okay. And so at that time, it was common for monks to, in order to beat their bodies into submission, they would wear uh, very scratchy clothing on purpose. Mm -hmm. They would beat themselves with whips, saying that they deserve that for their sounds sin. Sounds very current to me. What's that? <laughs> it sounds very current to me. That's all the stuff that we hear about. Yeah. It, the problem is, I think they forgot what grace was. They seem to be trying to pay for their sins. And so when we think about that, it's kind of interesting. You know, St. Gregory the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, they took a more expansive view of gluttony even, arguing that it also consists of an anticipation of meals, the eating of delicacies and costly foods, seeking after sauces and seasonings, and eating too eagerly. In other words, you should be eating your food bland. So, you know, you think about that. They were really into depriving yourself for the sake of the gospel or because you deserve it due to your sin. And I don't really think that's what God was going for. But let's kind of look at this a little bit. Uh, St. Gregory the Great, a doctor of the church, described five ways by which one can commit the sin of gluttony and corresponding biblical examples for each of them. So I thought we'd take a look at these. Uh, the first one is eating before the time of meals in order to satisfy the appetite. So you could say perhaps, you know, snacking between meals or something. And the example he gave was Jonathan eating a little honey when his father saw commanded no food to be taken before the evening. So that's kind of an interesting one there. And we'll take a look at that. The passage is 1 Samuel uh, 14. I have it if you want me to read it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Now the men of Israel were pressed to exhaustion that day because Saul had placed them under an oath, saying, Let a curse fall on anyone who eats before evening, before I have full revenge on my enemies. So no one ate anything all day even though they had all found honeycomb on the ground in the forest. They didn't dare touch the honey because they all feared the oath they had taken. But Jonathan had not heard his father's command, and he dipped the end of his stick into a piece of honeycomb and ate the honey. 
After he had eaten it, he felt refreshed. But one of the men saw him and said, Your father made the army take a strict oath that anyone who eats food today will be cursed. That is why everyone is weary, is weary and faint. My father has made trouble for us all, Jonathan exclaimed. A command like that only hurts us. See how refreshed I am now that I have eaten this little bit of honey? If the men had been allowed to eat freely from the food they found among our enemies, think how many more Philistines we could have killed. Mm. So how do you see gluttony displayed in this passage? This, this uh, St. Gregory thought there was gluttony in this passage, and he said it had to do with eating when it wasn't time to eat. What do you think? Well, on the one hand, Jonathan had not heard the command. Right. So I don't think he was necessarily in the wrong because he didn't know not to do it. Right. But then when he's saying, well, everybody would have been able to fight better if we had just been able to eat our fill. He's saying when you, I'm thinking of that as, as whatever food they find when they are attacking that city or whatever. Um, if they had been able to just eat everything they saw, well, how would that have benefited? Because then they'd be tired from overeating. Mm, that's true. Um, so I can kind of see both sides of his argument. One, he didn't know, so, but at the same time, the others were whining, well, wait a minute, you got to eat? Why didn't I get to eat? Um, so I don't know. I'm reminded of an old movie, I can't remember which one it was or anything, but someone was in a sword fight and they went into a banquet hall where they were fighting and the better swordsman kept picking up food off the table and was like eating an apple while he's doing this and that kind of thing, you know. I can almost see, oh, see Jonathan, you know, he's in the middle of the battle and go, huh, ah, there's an apple, yeah. I'll just... Here, there's a leg of lamb, let's take a bite, you know. It's, I remember what movie it is, but I'm not going to say it on the grounds that it may incriminate us <laughs> because we probably shouldn't know that movie so well. <laughs> okay. The one you and a bunch of pastors almost got kicked out of. Wow. Uh, it's a uh, really funny movie. It's kids. about Robin Hood. It's it's a funny yeah. movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's a silly, it's a silly Robin Hood. It's movie, a Mel Brooks, yeah. so that should tell you everything. Right? Yeah. Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Enough said. Um, okay, so. Let's think about their category. Let's think about the category for a minute. The category that Gregory had here was eating before the time of meals in order to satisfy the appetite. Leaving Jonathan aside for a minute, how is that gluttonous? Or how can that be gluttonous? If mom has budgeted all of the groceries for the month and has purchased what needs to be in the house, to get everyone through this time frame until the next time they go grocery shopping. And a teenager is sneaking in and grabbing what they want out of the cabinet when they know mom's cooking dinner. But they're gonna sneak in and they're gonna grab food. Well then when it's time to pack lunches, there's not gonna be snacks to go in the lunches for school, you know, for the younger kids or whatever, that, you know. I could kind of see that being an issue. Okay. Right well, or if you're you know, if you're eating between meals and you end up with 5,000 calories a day, that's it is. gluttonous. Yes, yeah. it is. And that's really easy to do, isn't it? It is. You know, uh, I used to have a real big problem with cookies. It's part of what made me well over 300 pounds and have liver issues. Um, you know, I'd be studying in my office in the afternoon, start getting a little sleepy and plan on eating six cookies and realized I'd eaten the entire package. Now, how many calories was that? I don't even know that I want to know. Well, when three was a serving and you were gonna eat six. Yeah, that was that already was double, see? Yeah. But, so yeah. that was a gluttonous behavior. I don't do that anymore. One, because it would make me really sick. Another, because I realized the folly of it. You know, just, it doesn't make sense. It's not wise. That was one of the churches that had cookies for Sunday every- Yeah, Sunday. I was always just having always to replace there. the cookies. Yeah. I remember when our kids found where the cookie stash was in one of our churches and they'd be eating the cookies and we didn't know about it and then Sunday comes and it's like, I thought we had more cookies than this in the cabinet. We found out, but we found out because they decided they were going to warm up the cookies because, you know, warm chocolate chip cookies are wonderful, so why not warm up some Oreos? 
But they didn't know how to run the microwave, so they pressed every button on the microwave until it started running. And they left it running. Burnt Oreo. Microwave burnt Oreos. Nasty yeah. smell to clean up. But we did figure out where all the cookies were going. We, we had to buy a whole lot of cookies to replace them. <laughs> all right, here's the second one. Seeking delicacies and better quality of food to gratify the vile sense of taste. That's, that's the actual quote there. To gratify the vile sense of taste. And the biblical example he uses is when Israelites escaping from Egypt complained, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Wow. Now, God rained fowls for them to eat, but punished them for their lack of trust in him. Uh, does someone have that Numbers 11, 31 to 35? Someone want to read that one for us? Numbers 11, 31 to 35. Now the Lord sent a wind that brought quail from the sea and let them fall all around the camp. For miles in every direction, there were quail flying about three feet above the ground. So the people went out and caught quail all that day and throughout the night and all the next day, too. No one gathered less than 50 bushels. They spread the quail all around the camp to dry. But while they were gorging themselves on the meat, when it was still in their mouths, the anger of the Lord blazed against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. So that place was called Kilbroth Hatava, which means graves of gluttony because there they buried the people who had craved meat from Egypt. From Kilbroth Hatava, the Israelites traveled to Hazaroth, where they stayed for some time. Okay, let's look at this passage for a minute. God brought in plenty of food for them. What were they supposed to do? What were they supposed to do? Take what they needed. Yeah. You know, gather what they needed to feed their family, not just gorge themselves. Yes. Think, think about that for a minute. How do you see gluttony displayed in this passage then? I mean, it's fairly obvious, but let's talk about that for a minute. Where do we see this kind of gluttony happen in our society? This, this style of gluttony. Where do we see that? Smorgasbords. Smorgasbords? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, I saw, we were at one of these uh, over in Indiana. And I saw a guy, and he was trying to go back, and he literally had his plate piled so high that stuff was falling off, and he's trying to catch it as he's going. And I'm thinking, you know, you can go back several times. <laughs> but I saw him go back several times with just as big a plate. I think I would have been sick as a dog if I'd eaten quite that much. They had a wonderful variety, which is why we went there, not so we could eat all of it. <laughs> I think he wanted to make sure he got his money's worth. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that happens there. All right, any, anywhere else that we see this kind of gluttony? Well, it says in 34, they buried the people who had craved other food. They weren't happy with what they had. And God had provided, but they weren't satisfied. I used to have a lady that would call me periodically and say, hey, I've got a whole bunch of oranges. Would you like some oranges? I've got a whole lot of... Uh, of uh, cans of tuna and, and various things. And finally I said, where are you getting all this? This is a, you know, this is a ton of food. She says, well, there were five food pantries open today. <laughs> and I can't possibly go through all of this. And that really happened. It, it took me about a year to figure out what exactly, you know, just to start asking because it just didn't seem once right. once in a while she'd call and say, hey, did you know Save a Lot has a bargain on this today? You know, so Which was good, that was helpful, but then she started giving us things that she hadn't mentioned to store. And come to find out, that's what she was doing, going from place to place to place. And in fact, at one point, she brought me so much of an item, I thought she was just wanting to donate to the food pantry, and I took it to down to our food pantry. No. Well, half of it had already come out of our food pantry. <laughs> and so it was like, okay, what's going on here? So she had went down got it out of the food pantry, claimed more people than she actually had in her house, took it all, then realized she had no place to put it because her cabinets were so full, and said, hey, can you use some of this? <laughs> it was 
It was gluttonous and generous all at the same time. So, you know, there is a problem with that. That can be a problem. Um, I think one thing that I think about is like, I, I saw a report about Venezuela. And you, most people know what's been going on in Venezuela. They call it the Venezuela diet. The people are losing about 10 pounds at least every year. The people themselves are going down by about 10 pounds every year. And it's not because they're trying, it's because they have less and less food. And then there were pictures from a sumptuous bake, uh, banquet that was given by their president for the ruling class. While these people were starving, he's heavyweight and giving big banquets for his people. That's a gluttonous behavior, I think, don't you? And I think that that really fits into this idea of you know, the taking too much. And the seeking delicacies. What do you think of this, this quote, vile sense of taste? What do you think that's about? That's kind of an interesting thing in the writing of Gregory. What do you think he means by that vile sense of taste? <clears throat> we eat for the enjoyment of it and the pleasure and not just for the sustenance. You know, we, we put food in a, you know, a class. I mean, it's nice that it tastes good, but when we're all, you know, so involved, and it would be very seldom just see simple foods. Yeah. You know, things just cooked simple, and, and that's the best for you. Mm -hmm. Without all that salt and sugar and butter and guilty, guilty, guilty. But <laughs> I, I mean, we, we, you know, food is, is just big with our society. It's just like, let well, alone the hoarding aspect of what pe uh, lengths people will go to, right. you know, to get food even if they could go buy it. You know, it's well, we saw that in the early part of the pandemic, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Where people were going in and absolutely buying everything and then other people would come who needed it who maybe they worked that day and they couldn't get the food because there wasn't anything to buy. That's a form of gluttony, I think. Even though they weren't necessarily outright eating it then, they were just taking everything. Taking everything. All right, let's look at the next one. Next one is seeking after food by sinful or disrespectful means. Now this is a really interesting one to me. The two sons of Eli, the high priest, treated the sacrifices in a disrespectful manner. And that's 1 Samuel 2, 12 to 16. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. Mm. Mm. Wow. All right, how do you see gluttony displayed in this passage? And taking from God. They were taking what was meant to be the sacrifice offered to the Lord, and they were taking the best part first. Yeah. It, it says in verse 17, so the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. Now think about that for a minute. Think about, this is kind of an interesting practice. Uh, I don't know if you know a lot about the sacrificial system, but there were various types of sacrifices. One of the main things had to do with the fact that the fat belonged to the Lord. The fat of the animal belonged to the Lord. And so what they would often do is boil it down, get the fat off of it, 
before they ate. And then the priests come along with their fork and take some of the sacrifice. And then the people would eat. And the, the, the blood of the sacrifice and the fat of the sacrifice belonged to the Lord. And then they got kind of, kind of a bland boiled meat. But these boys, what they were doing is they were going in even before God got his part and grabbing it. So when we see that as the, the gluttonous part of it, that's kind of a powerful image, isn't it? But how do we see this in our world today, this seeking after food in a sinful or disrespectful means? Obviously, we don't have these sacrifices. None of us are the, the sons of priests. So how might we behave in a fashion that would be gluttonous in, in this form, according to Gregory? When we don't take the Lord's tithe off of the top, and we keep, we wait and see how much we have left over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're supposed to... Your tithe is really supposed to come off your gross, not your net. You know? So that'd be one way. That's a good way to talk about it. Okay. Anything else? Any other way that we might do this? I'm thinking back to one church that used to have a potluck once a month. And there were kids in the neighborhood who didn't have enough to eat. And they would come to church, especially on potluck Sundays. Then after church was over, they'd go downstairs, and the kids would all line up first. And some of the adults would say, don't let them get in there. They're going to take all the food before we can get any. And they wanted to make the kids go last. Well, those kids needed the ministry of food at that point because they didn't have enough to eat at home. So I feel like that was food that, that God wanted those kids to have first because all those adults could go home and get food out of their pantries. Yes. But... You know, it, it was meant to be fellowship and outreach, not, you know, let's punish the kids and make them go last because they'll take, they'll get their dirty hands in there and take all the good stuff. Yeah. You know, and so the way that some of the adults, not all of them, but some of the adults looked at the kids from the neighborhood whose parents weren't there with them, they had come in because they knew there'd be food. The way that the older adults, some of the older adults looked at them was just wrong. Yeah, that would that would be a disrespectful manner, wouldn't it? And, and the thing about it is, it was pretty well known several of these families that had multiple kids that on weekends the kids didn't get to eat. They ate at school Monday through Friday. You know, this is why this uh, ministry is so important that Don is so heavily involved in here at the church. And you know they put food together for the, the weekend for kids who just won't have much. That's why that is so important. Joshua's church is up in Hennepin did the same thing. They had, I'm trying to remember what they called theirs. We just call the ours backpack week, ministry. I guess, yeah, just the backpack. We call ours Weekend Warrior. Theirs was the backpack ministry. Um, there's another one called Gumdrops mm -hmm. that all do these same things. But in that community, there wasn't anything like that. And so every time there was a potluck, those kids were there at church, even if that's the only time they came. And it was because they were so hungry. You know, and we actually had some of them show up at our house on Saturdays. They always came about the time dinner was ready. Mm -hmm. How did they know? <laughs> well, because they were very hungry kids. So that, yeah, that's, a, that's one way that you could say uh, in a sinful or disrespectful manner. Anything else you can think of? You have one, Don, you kind of looked up there. I was going to say, it's not just me that's involved with Weekend Warrior, though. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Okay. Right. Yeah, I know. I just mentioned you because you were in the room. Okay. And, cause you, I, and you're so heavily involved in it. Yeah. That's a ministry with multiple churches, isn't it? Yeah, but it's a ministry that a lot of people in this church are involved in. It oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. There, there's some who bring food and, and leave it to be sorted and organized, and there's some who take it to the schools, and there's some who give money to provide the food. and yeah. Yeah, so, the bags and, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's a wonderful ministry this church has. Terrific. And the, the Minister Alliance helps with some of it, too. It's, it's, 
I will say of all the things that community ministry happens, what, what a wonderful one these kids need it. Here, here's, a, here's kind of a funny example, maybe a sinful or disrespectful means. Um, and I don't think that the little girl understood, so I don't think it was, but think about this. This was kind of funny. When I was growing up, uh, we went to uh, Susquehanna Assembly of God uh, in uh, uh, Independence, Missouri. You know, years and years ago, when I was just, oh gosh, I think we left there when I was in first grade, so that or second grade maybe, because so it tells you how long ago that was. And at the time, we had a, a pastor, Brother Odom, and he had a little girl who was younger than me, and you know, I was pretty young. And before anyone received communion there, uh, all the adults would kneel down at their pews and turn and face the pew and they'd kneel down and they'd pray for a while. Then they'd go up and they'd get their communion, they'd come back and they'd kneel down again and they'd pray 20, 30 minutes even. And then, then they would finally have a closing hymn and stuff and, and no, no kids were allowed to have communion. That was against the rules. You couldn't have communion as a child. And so, you know, we were all just sitting there waiting for the adults to finally finish praying so we could go on home, you know. And it never failed. As soon as the adults would turn around and kneel and start praying at their seat, you'd see the pastor's little girl and she'd kind of come out of the pew where she was there. Mom was on the floor, you know. She'd kind of sneak up and she'd look around and she'd grab some, they used saltine cracker, crackers for their bread. And she'd grab a big handful of them and run back to her seat and, Eat them, you know, and then you know the adults go up and get communion and everything, and and they'd all be praying. And she would come from that nearly the back row, and she'd run up there and grab a handful. Well, by the time that they were done praying, all the crackers were gone. But you know, if you think about that, now she's a little bitty girl; she didn't really understand fully, although she was looking around to make sure no one was watching. But that could be a sinful or disrespectful manner of getting food, you know. I think that would be one. All right, here we go. Here's another one. Exceeding the necessary amount of food. And this is the one we normally think of. Uh, and believe it or not, this is one of the sins of Sodom. Uh, was fullness of bread. And so it says in Ezekiel um, 16, 49, it says... Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. That's interesting. This is one that we're so familiar with, right? Eating more than is, uh, is necessary. All right, so here's another. That, that word gluttony literally does mean full of bread. You ever been full of bread? Literally, it's gluttony. <laughs> All right, how about this one? Taking food with too much eagerness, even when eating the proper amount, and even if the food is not luxurious. Well, Gregory didn't give anybody any room, did he? Esau selling his birthright for ordinary food of bread and pottage of lentils is the example he gives. Okay, who would read Genesis 25? It's 27 to 34. Genesis 25. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, referring to, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all of his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and linen stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. All right. 
So, how do we see gluttony displayed in this passage? Well, he was hungry, obviously. He probably wasn't dying of hunger. Yeah. Um, but he was hungry and he told these verse right. He gave up far too much for far too little, didn't he? Right. Yeah. What is the birthright? Why, why is that? What's the importance of the birthright? Do you, anyone remember? The firstborn inherited just about everything, didn't they, back then? Yeah, at least a double portion, if nothing else. Yeah, if, even if they didn't inherit all, they inherited a double portion in comparison to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So say you had six kids, it's divided into uh, seven, and then you give two portions to one of the kids. That's a pretty important thing he gave up for a little bit of uh, lentil soup. Well, I don't know, I'm not even a big fan of lentils. I can't imagine giving it up for that. And he got the soup at wow. some time anyway. Yeah. He would have got it eventually. I mean, the parents were pretty poor excuses, though, of parents. Oh, they were, yes. One loved the one and one loved the other. I mean, you know, what kind of parenting is that? Terrible. <laughs> certainly didn't have much of an example. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to look for a good example of parenting, do not go to Jacob and Esau's parents. No. It's kind of like if you want to see a really good example of marriage, don't go to John Wesley. Go to his brother Charles. <laughs> John Wesley's marriage was a disaster. Complete and utter disaster. But, you know, yeah, you're right. They were terrible parents. But, I, you know, if we think about this, this is kind of an interesting one. So, it's the idea that he's so over-eager to get his food that he'll give up anything for it. He will do anything for it. And it's not like he's going to starve. This is a wealthy family. It truly is. It's a wealthy family. Any, anytime you read the passages, and you know, if you look at it, they're very wealthy. The man's not going to starve. There's no way on earth he'll starve. But yet... He's so eager he'll give up anything for such a simple thing. Do we ever see this kind of deal in our world today where people are just too overly eager? Probably, I just can't think of an example. Good. Not in my world, I don't think. But. Yeah. Uh, now, now our, our parents might sometimes say that we are because we eat way too fast. <clears throat> yes. You know? Taking food with too much eagerness, even when eating the proper amount, and even if the food is not luxurious. There's this idea of you're eating it so fast you can't even be grateful for it, you know. I mean, My it, mother it, used to say often, did you even taste that? Mm-hmm. You ate it so fast, how did you even taste it? We say that to our dog all the time, because she's such a fast eater. <laughs> Ab Abby is the perfect picture of gluttony. In the morning when you open her kennel, she runs past you like she is out of the starting gate at a Greyhound race, runs through to the kitchen as fast as she can, running so hard that when she comes off the rug and hits the floor, she slides sideways and lands next to her bowl. And then the minute you drop the food in the bowl, she eats it so fast, you don't even know if she really had, had any food to begin with. Perfect picture of gluttony right there in the dog. But I think all dogs are kind of like that in some ways. But ours in particular, she is, I mean, she is on it. And will eat absolutely anything at any time and as much as she can possibly get. I do not think there is full in that dog. I don't think there is. All right, so this is really subjective. This one's kind of hard. Which one of these examples of gluttony do you think is the worst type? So which do you think, of all these examples, which is the worst? And we all may have different ideas about that. I'm taking the best off the top in, in the way that we steal from God by not giving him our best or the first of, of our income or whatever. So seeking after food in a sinful or disrespectful manner is Becky's, okay? Anything else? Anybody else that has one? Which is the worst kind of gluttony to you? Well, it's pretty bad to complain about the food that God had already provided for you. That was a miracle in itself. There That's true. Absolutely. I mean, and we do that. Yes. So, 
on the honor roll. So a lack of gratefulness. Because mm -hmm. there are truly people who are starving out there. To me, I, I'm with you on that one. I think that might be the worst. Is simply the fact that often we are not grateful for what we have. I remember, I don't remember who it was, but a church member called me when it was becoming difficult to get food in the grocery store and they asked me if we had enough food because they had had some extra. And I said, uh, you know, we've got plenty of food. Uh, we may not necessarily have what we want to eat, but we've got plenty of food. We will be fine for a while, you know? And I was grateful for what we had. Had, had our cabinets been empty, had the freezers been empty or whatever, that would have been a disastrous situation. And I'm sure that there were some households that their cabinets were empty, that their, that, you know, their freezers were empty. And so not being thankful, I think you're right. For me, that would be the one that I think is possibly the worst. Anybody else have an idea of what you think is the worst? Like I said, it's a little subjective. It's your opinion. For me, I think it's thankful. Uh, it's so easy to take things for granted and then start to expect them. Mm -hmm. I think that is really important there. Well, according to Gregory, the fifth way is the wor is worse than all the others. And so that was the one, uh, taking food with too much eagerness, even when eating the proper amount and even if the food is not luxurious. He thought that was the, birth, the, the worst one because it shows attachment to pleasure most clearly. Hmm. Uh, to recapitulate, St. Gregory the Great said that one may succumb to the sin of gluttony by time when, okay, qual, uh, quality, uh, stimulants, quantity, and eagerness. I don't know. To me, the eagerness one didn't really, didn't really fit as much for me. To me, that was the, the least important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're still eating the right amount of food. You're just really yeah, eager I don't to think eat. There's anything wrong with eagerness? I mean, I think that's kind of eagerness, and I, I, I don't see anything terribly wrong with that. I don't either. Now, his example he uses of eagerness—that was a pretty nasty yeah, thing. Was, that wasn't that good. Was, that was just. That was. I don't see that that really comes up with the, I mean, I take some of that. Yeah, I, I didn't agree with that one. All right, well, from the sermon, I had this. From just a simple reading of the text, we find many passages that encourage eating or at least put it in a positive light. Right in the first book of the Bible, we're told that Eden was planted with every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food. And so God intended us to have good food. He really did. God wanted us to take pleasure in food. In the final book of the Bible, we are told there is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. In the Song of Solomon, the lover takes the beloved to the banqueting table. The great climax of history will be celebrated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, and Jesus himself taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Even the way we are encouraged to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus is around a meal. And so God intended us to enjoy food. He intended us, uh, Sharon, you were saying, you know, almost everything we do has food involved in it. And God did intend fellowship. And fellowship often is around the table. In fact, one of the, the, the most uh, hospitable things you could do in the ancient Near East was to be willing to sit down and have a meal with someone. Still is. I think so too. <laughs> My favorite way of having friends is in is to sit around, even if it's just having pizza, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but having fellowship around the dinner table. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, food is very important. I mean, we have to have food. That's one thing. Nobody can get by without eating, plain and simple. God made it that way on purpose. And so to me, it's kind of, what's the problem here? The problem with gluttony is not food, right? It's abuse of food. Yes, it's abusive. Say more about that, just to... 
Me? Yeah. Anytime you abuse anything, it, it, you know, when we take anything to extremes, it's probably going to be wrong. I mean, God intended us to eat food. He intended us to consume 2,500 calories a day. When we go to 5,000, we're going to have a problem. Yeah. If we cut back to a thousand, we're going to have a problem. If we eat the wrong kind of stuff, we're going to have a problem. But if we follow it the way it's intended, it's going to work for us. Yeah. And so it's like all these other things we've talked about so far, isn't it? You know, the, the sin of lust. God gave the gift of sexuality and everything within the bonds of marriage. That was intended as a good thing. But not to every woman on the block. For Ex the same time. Exactly. I mean, it's not, you know. Right. It's... Yeah. And we could say that people are gluttonous for that. You know, you could say that. That, that lust turns into a type of gluttony. It does. Greed's the same way. God intended us to have... Uh, I think he intended us to have some nice things. I think that's where Gregory and his elk kind of had it wrong. They thought that they should live the poorest life possible and that they should, you know, even forego even the slightest nicety as a way of being faithful to God. But I don't think God really intends that. But I don't think God intends gold-plated toilets either. Diamond encrusted choo choo trains, like a former bishop we had. Yeah. That is a, a greed or a gluttony for wealth. So the problem really is with the heart, it's really with the attitude. Gluttony is about obsession with the physical appetites. And it may be food. We've talked a lot about food. It may be drink, right? You can be gluttonous with, with alcohol. And we know that turns into some really bad mess. Having a glass of wine may not be gluttonous, but having a, an entire box of wine, yeah, that's probably gluttonous, you know? Things of that nature. Uh, tobacco, tobacco, it, it can be that. Uh, illicit drugs, well, that's always a mess, isn't it? But people can be obsessed with that in a gluttonous way. So when we place any appetite ahead of our relationship with God and others, we are engaged in the sin of gluttony. So how do you see gluttony getting in the way of our relationship with God? How do you see it getting in the way of our relationship with God? Which is more important. Mm. When you put it first. Yeah. Even simple things, when they're put in front of our relationship with God, become sin. All right, so we need a healthy dose of the antidote to gluttony, which is temperance or self-restraint, or you might say discipline. So I have a whole series of scripture texts here. Gentleness and self-control, there is no law against these things. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 from the New Living Translation. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Mm. Mm. Titus 2.12, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age, to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. 2 Peter 1, 5-7. For this reason, you must make every effort to support your faith goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. Proverbs 25, 16. Do you like honey? Don't eat too much, or it will make you sick. <laughs> I love that one. That one good. Just matter of fact. For me, I, I would replace chocolate with, I would, you know, replace the honey with chocolate because I have been known to eat myself sick with chocolate, <laughs> but not with honey. Yeah. First Corinthians 9, 25. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. 
but we do it for eternal and eternal prize. First Peter five eight. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Okay, Second Corinthians five twenty one. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 2 Timothy 1-7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Daniel 1-8 But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Okay. All right, so let's talk about these for just a minute. If you notice, what is the common theme through most of them? What's the common theme? Answer to nine, isn't it? Pretty much kind of self-control and training and um, everything in moderation. Yeah. It, it really isn't that any of these things are a problem. It all has to do with, like we've already said, the place we give them in our lives. You know, chocolate is a wonderful thing. For those who really like chocolate, it's a wonderful thing. And having a piece of chocolate, there's nothing wrong with that unless you're allergic to it and it cause you to die. You know, some people have anaphylaxis then you you know you would be pretty reckless if you ate a piece if it was going to cause that but otherwise eating a piece of chocolate nothing wrong with that eating a pound of chocolate on the other hand might be a problem right eating 10 pounds of chocolate then you're really in trouble you know so i'm guessing i shouldn't eat my weight in chocolate oh i don't think that'd be a good idea <laughs> don't think you'd live long doing that especially a diabetic huh <laughs> You know, anything that we do to excess can bring a problem. So why do you think temperance or self-control are important in the life of a believer specifically? And we can talk about anybody and, you know, we can talk about health and all that. But why do you think it's important in the life of the, of the believer specifically? We'll go with the, with the chocolate or eating in general. A lot of us are emotional eaters. And at times when we are upset or depressed or frustrated or whatever, instead of turning to God to ask for his guidance and his help through the situation, we eat. If God has blessed us with something awesome, instead of taking time to be in prayer and praise God for the wonderful blessings he's given us, we go out to a big fancy dinner and we eat instead of praying and offering our praise or asking for um, God's help. And if we had a little bit of self-control and we would remind ourselves all the blessings that we get are from God and we need to thank him for them. And also when we're hurting or struggling with something, he wants to help us, but he wants us to ask. Mm -hmm. And if we would spend time in prayer as opposed to going and reading the the snack pantry, you know, it's, it's where you put your emphasis. If you focus on trying to con have self-control, not overeat, talk to God when you're having those, those emotional eating tendencies, you know, talk to him about the stuff that's going on in your day instead of just filling the mouth with food. <clears throat> fill your mind with Christ instead of filling your mouth with food. Okay. Anybody else? Why is it specifically important for the believer? Temperance, self-control, discipline, whatever, whatever word you want to use, they all seem to have the same thing. I think we need to show the world that we are controlled by God and not by the things of the world. Ideally, we need to show that. Yeah, I think it's Early. If you're disciplined in your, your life in, in the flesh, 
you'll also be disciplined in the temptations of the world that, you know, lead you astray from, you know, that, that self-control because, you know, if you're just weak in everything and don't do everything, well, then you're just going to be talked into anything. Or, uh, it, it takes... takes a lot of uh, prayer. <laughs> yes, yes. Anything else? You know, when I think about this, I think it really does have to do with partly what Don was talking about there is really important, is this understanding that how can we be a good example to the world when we are not able to hold on and to, to live a life that is pleasing to God as well. And you know, Becky's talking about the idea that, um, you know, instead of going to the Lord when we're upset, we instead stuff our face, um, that can be an unhealthy thing. And, you know, I think you're right about that. If you can control this area, then you can deal with any of it. I think that's really important. All right, one more here. It says, why is temperance, self-control, slash discipline so difficult for us? What do you think? Maybe someone that hasn't answered anything. Why, why do you think it's so difficult? Well, the devil's always there ready to tempt you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that he's prowling around. Watch out. You know, be on guard. Yeah. Or anybody else. Why is it so difficult? Society has made lack of self-control or self-discipline to be the norm. Mm. We've gotten too used to it with what we see on TV and what we see in the movies and even on the news, you know, seems like the, the, the norm has become overindulging in whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good part of it. I mean, if we're going to go strictly on food, for me, the most difficult thing is I am hungry. Mm -hmm. I need to eat. And the problem is, when do you stop eating? You know, there's the problem. You know, uh, so I think that's part of it. We are thirsty. We are hungry. We are in need of sustenance. If we put that at the center, it could be a problem. Now, this is not one of them on here, but it's another question that comes to mind. How can gluttony in any of its forms get in the way of the calling that God has on your life to make disciples of Jesus Christ? Because you realize that all of us are called to that ministry of making disciples of Jesus Christ. How can gluttony, that particular sin, get in the way of that? No. <laughs> our, our minds are killing our gluttony rather than not doing what God wants us to do. Yeah. Our, our mind's just not focused. When we're, we can only focus really on one thing at a time. Hmm. Um, we focus well on one thing at a time. So I think that sometimes our lack of temperance can get in the way of our ability to minister to others as well. Okay, the, la the last question here. How can the Holy Spirit help you to control your appetite so you will not commit the sin of gluttony? You can ask him to guide us to make better choices. Okay. So, you know, how can the Holy Spirit help us? Try to bring it into the Lenten context. Think about what you may have given up for Lent or something of that nature. How can the Holy Spirit help you to keep on track for that? When an awful lot of people give up food items. I used to have a friend who really liked beer and he gave up beer for Lent every year. It was a struggle for him. But he usually made it the entire 40 days and he didn't know that you could, you know, on Sunday, since it's a little Easter, that you didn't have to hold on to it there. So it was 46 days for him. So think about it in the Lent idea. How can the Holy Spirit help you to keep track with your Lenten discipline? Especially if it's given up something that can be in this gluttonous category. He'll guide you in a different direction. Okay. 
You know, when we're tempted to give up, the whole, if we turn to the Lord, you know, first of all, the Holy Spirit, you know, if you've, if you've said, Lord, you know, if you prayed about it, Lord, I'm going to give up. I don't know, what's a strange thing to give up? Bubble gum. I'm going to give up bubble gum for all of Lent. Maybe, that's a, a, maybe there's a child that did that, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have a bubble gum for all of Lent. You've told the Lord you're going to do it. When you're tempted to unwrap hubba bubba or whatever, the Holy Spirit may uh, remind you of that. Say, hey, um, remember, this isn't supposed to be happening right now. You're not supposed to be doing that. Or when you're really tempted, you can spend some time in prayer. And I think that goes for all of us when we are trying to maybe live more healthy. You know, uh, I got to tell you, sometimes it, it takes an awful lot of, of prayer just to get me to do my exercises because they hurt. But if I don't do my exercises for rehab, guess what? I hurt worse. Sometimes I really have to ask the Lord to give me strength because it hurts so bad to do it. But yet they're important. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to come together tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your love and for your blessings. We thank you, God, that you are always with us. Lord, help us to have our appetites in line with your will. Father, it, it's easy for us to sit here and become, um, well, condemned in the midst of this if we just lay it on eating too much. But Lord, really, when we're talking about gluttony, we know it has to do with our hearts. So help us, Lord, to have our hearts our lives, our eyes fixed on you. Help us to look to you when we need strength and help us to always bring glory and honor to you no matter what. Lord, give us that self-discipline, that temperance that we need in order to live more fully for you and to be a good witness in the world that others might see your grace and your glory. Lord God, we just lift up to you, Elaine, tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would give her freedom from pain. That, Father, you would bring your healing touch and your power upon her right now in Jesus' name. Lift up Matt and Lindsay to you. We ask, Father, that you remove this COVID virus from their bodies, that you would strengthen them right now in the name of Jesus. Help them to know your presence. Father, we lift up Mark to you. We just ask that you would be with him tonight, that you would strengthen him. And, and Lord, as he awaits these tests, we just ask that your peace would be with him. Lord, we lift up Janet to you as she deals with COVID. Father, we just pray that you would bring your healing. Lord, as she continues to have a, a, a more difficult time with this virus, we just pray that you would just do a, a, just a marvelous job of healing on her. Lord, we lift up my mother and just ask that you be with her as she goes for surgery on Friday. Lord, we ask for healing and strength. And Lord, we ask for freedom from pain. Lord, we pray for the schools, for all those involved, for the students, the teachers, the, the administrators, the support staff. Father, as they get ready to go back to uh, something that's more like what it normally is with the school, with all the kids there at once, Father, we just ask for safety. We ask, Lord, that you would protect each and every one of these children, each and every one of the staff. Lord, help them to know your presence in the midst of it. And Lord, we just pray that this virus will be stamped out so that no one else is sickened by it. Lord God, we lift up Sharon to you and so many others who are in need of that touch from you right now as they deal with loss. Lord God, comfort them and bring them peace. Help them to know your love and your presence. Help them to know, Lord, that you are always with them. Father, be with this nation. For those situations that have just completely gotten out of hand in our political debate, Lord God, may we learn once again what it means to be uh, really a nation of people that we might not be so angry about how one side wants to do things or the other that we fight amongst ourselves. Instead, Lord, we ask that there would be peace in our nation. There'd be peace in families that have been divided by politics and in, 
in church groups and in, in just all kinds of areas of life where division has come. Lord God, give our leaders wisdom. Be with our president and vice president. Lord, be with their whole administration that you would give them great wisdom on, on how they should proceed. Be with our Congress, Lord, and help them to look to you when they do not know the answer. Help them, Lord, not to put themselves or their next election in place of what is best for all of us. We ask the same for our state leaders and our local leaders, that they might always look to you. We lift up your church today, especially the United Methodist Church. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to more fully serve you. And for the various factions within our church, Father, help us not to put our eyes on temporal things, but on the eternal things, that many more might be led to you. We pray, Lord, that we might bring glory and honor to you each and every step of the way. And Father, in all things, May we reach out to those who are hurting today, that they may know your love and your grace. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us in this video. I hope it was a blessing to you. If you have any questions that you would like answered in a future uh, midweek service, then I invite you to send those to me through email at pastorbillwigsjr at gmail.com. And I'll be glad to try to answer some of those questions during our midweek services. Now, we do meet on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. at the Sunfield Church. And we meet on Thursday night at the Greenwood Church at 6 o'clock as well. But I hope that uh, this is really a blessing to you. We're bringing it to you on Fridays uh, as just a, an extra boost to your spiritual life. So I just pray that the Lord will be with you as you go throughout your day and throughout your evening, you'll know his presence. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and may he give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have a great rest of the day.